Привіт! Мене звати Таша, з вами Idea Roll. Це канал, де ми з друзями граємо в настольно-рольові ігри по дуже різним системам. Також нас бувають огляди і інтерв'ю. І саме сьогодні в нас інтерв'ю з Полом Фрікером, який є одним з основних редакторів останньої сьомої редакції «Поклику Ктулху». Він розкаже, чи варто читати Lovecraft, та щоб водити чи грати в поклик Ктулху, дасть трохи інсайтів в свою роботу як автора і редактора, а також у вас буде нагода почути трохи української, української у виконанні Пола. Приємного перегляду! Hello and welcome to Idea Roll. My name as always is Tasha and my amazing guest today is Paul Fricker. Hi Paul. Good evening, Tasha. Before we continue, I'd like to remind that this interview is conducted under the framework of Kasulu Weekend online Ukrainian convention, which will take place 1st through 3rd December 2023. I will add all details to the video description so you can uh, attend and enjoy. There will be Call of Cthulhu games, interesting workshops, and of course an auction with cool prizes to support armed forces of Ukraine. We love supporting our defenders with and without conventions, so I will also leave links to the credible charitable funds and organizations uh, in the video description. And remember that there is no such thing as small donation, every bit counts. And without further ado, let's dive in. Paul, may I ask where you're joining from? I'm in uh, in a small town called Buckingham in England. Um, I imagine this is not where Chaosium is located. <laughs> Chaosium is located all around the world. Uh, so uh, we have we have staff members in America, of course. We have in England, me and Mike, uh, in, and Lynn, and various other people. Uh, in Australia, um, it, in France, all sorts of places. We're, we're kind of pretty spread out. Now, this is amazing. Was it always like that? Or was it an influence of, I don't know, COVID when many people switched to mm. working from home? No, I think it was before that because me and Mike started working on uh, 7th edition like around 2008. So, you mm, know, long way before. before. Yeah, way before that. So I think there's always been, it, you know, the core of it has is, is always been in America, starting off in uh, in California. But then, you know, around the world, people start writing for it. Uh, so they wouldn't necessarily be staff members, but they'd be writing for it and making submissions. So, you know, Mark Morrison when it was, well, I presume he was in Australia. Uh, he was one of the early authors. Uh, and uh, yeah, a whole, a whole range of people. It, 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 you know, it brings the community together before even we had the internet. <laughs> <laughs> before the, wow, yeah. did, did you use was, like smoke fires? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Just signal. Um, well, does that mean you travel a lot? Or uh, not really? Yeah, I tr well, I don't know what you call a lot, but I travel, I like to travel, especially, I, I love going to America, uh, to Gen Con and some of the conventions over there. Uh, I travel around the UK to conventions. I was at a convention up in Manchester in, in England last weekend. Hmm. So part of the appeal for me is traveling around to conventions. Yeah, definitely. Well, cool, because my next question was about conventions, whether you visit them, whether you're enjoying or, or vice versa, trying to avoid them. Maybe it's too many in your life. Oh, right. Well, I guess that there are always more that I could go to, um, but I maybe go to, I don't know, maybe one a month, maybe as many as that, some months, none at all. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, it's just something I really enjoy. And I think I enjoy convention games as well. That's something I really enjoy because when you're playing with your home group, that's nice. Yeah, well, it's really nice, but it's a it's a very familiar feeling. It's people you know, it's, you know, it's people you're comfortable with and uh, it's, it's all great. But you, you get to know those people and their friends and everything. That, that's 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 a, one type of game. But going to a convention is a very different thing because you meet people perhaps you only see once a year so that's nice meeting old friends but also you meet new people and that's that's great because you get to sit down with new people and make up you know stories so yeah. uh, that's that's a lot of fun cool do you run games more or do you get to play as a player on conventions 
Um, a bit of both. So I try to always do both. I'm going to have to just let the cat in because she's meowing oh, at the course. door and I fear <laughs> that she's going to want... Just no excuse problem. me one minute. Come in then. Come on. Yeah. I do apologise. Sorry about that. That is totally <laughs> fine. What's the, the name she's of the cat? Ginny. Genie. You can just see, well, bits of her <laughs> on the screen. Um, doesn't usually bother me, but I think because my wife's still at work, um, she's got a late evening this evening, and uh, Gin is wondering where she is. So sorry, that interrupted us. We were talking, what were we talking about? Conventions? Oh, we were talking games. about uh, being a GM and being a player. Yeah, so I really like GMing, but I also really like playing the game. Uh, and I think that's kind of the for me that's the ideal i think some people just like gming some people just like playing and that's fine if they if that's the thing they like i've no problem with that um but for me i like to do a bit of both because there's a i wouldn't want to just run games it's a, it's an in, it's, i find it quite an intense experience um and so it's it, you know it's not that playing doesn't like take any energy and, and sort of imagination it does but it's a it, it's a very different experience i find so uh, it is it is yeah i'm totally in your team i also enjoy both playing and gm and trying to balance that yeah i think so i think that's the ideal and i think you as a as a as a player or well, i don't know what to call it as a as a player stroke keeper you gain from both experiences um so you get to see the experience from both sides of the table which is uh which is great um do you play mostly call of cthulhu or other systems too when i'm running it's usually call of cthulhu uh when i'm playing sometimes call of cthulhu but really i try and play a lot of other games as well because as a as someone who's designing rules it's good to experience you know other mechanics and other other rule systems in other games and you know how how other games sort of deal with with scenarios and, and everything so i mean like at the weekend uh i was at uh, grog meet in manchester and i played let me see paranoia which is an old game from the 1980s are you familiar with that um i know it exists and as a matter of fact, just recently we got it presented for a birthday to Andri, our tech guy, who was helping us to set this interview. And oh, he, okay. he was trying to convince me to play it <laughs> for some time now. It's a very kind of high concept game. You know, you're, you're individuals, you, you live in a complex run by friend computer uh, and you, you, you have a certain security level based on a color and you, every, it's illegal to be a member of a secret society but everybody is a member of a secret society and it's illegal to and you have to do it exactly so so as a as a player character you have a secret mission and you're part of a you know secret society so but the great thing is people can die over and again because in this computer complex you have six clones oh so when you die your your next clone just turns up does he have your memory yeah, pretty much yeah cool so That's it's just a, cool. but it i think some people play it seriously i guess you could i never have it's always been a just a, a fun game for us for me anyway it's because uh, it's kind of ridiculous um but uh yeah that, that so that's a lot of fun then i played what else did i play i played vason the uh, oh. free league game and then i play this is a nice chance for me once again to uh advertise because recently ukraine and creatures vessel book was released in ah. english it's available oh, right. uh the pdf uh, pdf is available free on drive through rpg i will throw in the link uh and uh yes please uh, check it out download it uh, if you didn't i hope you love it sorry and then to interrupt. I played... no sorry, sorry. And then I played Dragonbane, um, which is an old Swedish game, basically their version of D&D from the 80s, uh, which has been revamped and, and put out again. So, uh, yeah, so I like to just play new games and old games and, and just try and find out what's going on, really. <laughs> yeah. 
Nice. Um, so, um, talking about Call of Cthulhu, how did mm-hmm. you first discover for yourself the great old ones? <laughs> A friend, uh, the same friend that introduced me to role-playing games to start with, a few years later, uh, mentioned Call of Cthulhu and H.P. Lovecraft, and he uh, he gave me a book, the novel, to, to read, well, collected short stories, to read one of the stories, and I found that quite creepy, and then off the back of that, we decided, let's get the role-playing game, because I'd seen the name in, uh, in White Dwarf magazine, which was a magazine published in the UK, a role-playing game magazine. So I'd seen the name Call of Cthulhu, but I had no idea what it meant. Um, and I think this was back in the 1980s. And all I'd re- well, I'd played a few different games, but mostly of the kind of Dungeons and Dragons style, which is, you know, obviously very, very removed from real life or the present day. And then, and, and the idea of playing a game in which you played ordinary people in well either modern day or in the 1920s we, we just couldn't figure how that would work how would you do that um so that was that was really intriguing and also we both we, yeah i think we were both fans of horror horror stories and horror films and so on uh and so we got it and i ran a uh, paper chase which is uh-huh. in the starter box set and just one-on-one one keeper one player and it was great it was not like like no D game we'd played we just played it by the well kind of by the book and it was just a great experience and then we just wanted more and i think back then we didn't have a lot of money and we just we just wrote our own scenarios mostly we just made stuff up um and uh yeah that kind of opened a whole new world for us and and then that you know here we are today <laughs> Uh, I will jump on opportunity to say that the starter set is being released in Ukrainian officially soon, and uh, I think they, they already either started given uh, access to a PDF or will open it soon. And uh, I think somewhere up around New Year we can expect uh, the box with all of the um, adventures in there. So if you Excellent. want to try a paper chase with uh, your uh, party, please do consider. See, Paul himself started uh, Call of Cthulhu adventuring with this scenario. And look yeah, where I... it got him. <laughs> <laughs> I think when Mike was working on the starter box set, I said to him, you know, that was well actually there was a panel in Nec- necronomicon the a, a, a kind of uh call of cthulhu lovecraft convention in in america and there was a panel about hmm, either favorite scenarios or scenarios that people started with and a number of people said paper chase uh and i think that was that was the point at which like mike was like right that that's the one that's going into the starter box set along with several <laughs> others <laughs> And that starter box set, I mean, I can talk about it because I didn't, I didn't have a direct hand in in producing it, so I, I can talk sort of freely about it if you like. Uh, I'd love to. It, it it gets it gets a lot of um, praise as being like the mold around which other games are trying to make their starter sets. I think, um, and. I did a I did a, a, a talk with uh, well I participated with the the storytelling cooperative, uh, who are a, um, a website that run various courses online, and one of their courses is a write your first adventure course, and it takes you through uh, how to how to write and publish a role playing game adventure, and I wrote the, uh, the the Call of Cthulhu part for it. Um, and the, yeah, the starter box set. I had to, they they did a thing about the starter box set. So I, I I opened it up and I read it from the start. And I realised that when you open up the starter box, I'm getting distracted by my cat again. When you open up the starter box, the first thing you do there's a solo adventure, and like within minutes you're playing the game. You're playing a game as you make a character. You haven't got to sit there and read like pages and pages and pages and pages of rules before you can do anything. It 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 leads you directly into playing the game which is great and then there's uh, an adventure for well you play that solo adventure which is fun and then you then there's the one-on-one which is uh, the one we just talked about 
and then, then there's a couple more scenarios that you can run for you know a few friends so and by the time you've got through the starter box you're ready for anything <laughs> you can you could really run you know whatever call of cthulhu adventures you wanted then uh very true and uh, i myself discovered um call of cthulhu through starter set uh, right. i think we played uh, edge of darkness yeah yep yeah yeah so. brilliant Next to us. Uh, I just discovered that we have some questions from the audience. Uh, so, oh, okay. uh, yep, they're asking, what was the best convention you have visited? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> let's see. That's hard. The best oh. one. Um, I'm going to say it probably is Necronomicon um, because it's it's not it it's kind of a medium size the conventions range from like 30 or 40 people up to 30 or 40 thousand well more than that uh, i think gen con has like 70 or 80 thousand uh, i had Necronomicon, no idea it's so large oh yeah it's huge it's huge um necronomicon is like a few thousand mm -hmm. and everybody there is interested in you know the Cthulhu mythos. It might be fiction, it might be films, it might be stories, it might be gaming, uh, but everybody's got that shared interest. And it all takes place in Providence, which is, uh, you know, where Lovecraft... Just perfect. Yeah, where Lovecraft uh, lived. So, in it, so it's a lovely sort of historic town. And yeah, there's just so much going on and there's so many people that i know that go there so it's for me it's it's great because i just i just know lots of people and uh it's just a and it's a, a kind of relaxed atmosphere and uh yeah so that that's always fun cool um which scenario really scared you which scenario really scared me okay um I'd say there was an instance on um, it was horror on the Orient Express. I can't remember the exact location, um, but there's one where we went over and there was uh, yeah, it was kind of a, a creepy island. And I think the keeper actually, because he liked ghouls, he added a bunch of ghouls into the into the into the scene, and, mm -hmm. and that that it really came alive at that point. And uh, well um yeah it was kind of creepy we were creeping around crypts and uh there were i don't know it was it was it was that, that was a creepy one i'm just trying to cast my mind back I, I can remember some scenarios that definitely frightened some of the players when i was running um, for example there's one called an unhealthy occupation never even uh, heard no, I mean there's so many scenarios. I think this was published in a in a magazine years ago. It might get republished at some point, but it's one where um, you're in an old house, and well, this is kind of be spoilers, but that you're in basically you're in an Spoiler old alert. house. alert! You've yeah. been warned. Okay, you're in an old house to like look over all these collected old books, and you think you're alone in the house. That you're you're looking after, looking over all these old books that the deceased person has left, but you're not alone. There's something else there, and so I ran that. And uh, my friend, uh, he said, on his way home because he was driving home, leaving my house at, at night. He said halfway home, he had to pull the car over into a, into into like a petrol station and open the boot to make sure there was no one there. <laughs> Well, that means you did a really great job as a keeper. <laughs> so I always remember that. That just amused me. But he was happy with it. He wasn't like upset by it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but just so, in case. Think... No, go on. No, but then just in case to open and check out that there is no one yeah. there. Um, so I think often, I think that's an interesting question though, when which ones are actually scary? Because often they play with the elements of horror so the things that you know uh, monsters and creepy old books but often we're not actually scared we don't actually feel fear as as a as a player and i think that's quite unusual i think that's 
we can feel the element of fear that our investigators are having and we can sort of associate with that but i think it's quite rare that the player actually experiences fear and i think if you're going to do that then you need to have a bit of a discussion with your players beforehand to say is everybody on board with this do we really want to get you know at times get really serious and actually experience that that kind of uh, intensity and i think that's difficult to achieve unless you're you know with a with a group that you get on well with and you're you may be in a in in somebody's house and in a private place that's you know you can sort of set all that up that's difficult to achieve at a convention i think you can get the 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 kind of um reactions of, of sort of revulsion or surprise or whatever but to actually get genuine fear is is yeah that's and it's not necessarily something that we aim for but you can if you want agreed we uh we here are absolutely pro uh safety tools and yeah. uh, we do want to scare the characters and maybe scare the players in a good way like when you're watching yeah. a horror movie or something getting chills but uh, nevertheless sometimes there are topics or i don't know settings which um, mm. are more um i don't know how to form it properly appealing uh get under your skin uh for example would you agree that playing uh, scenarios in modern day might be a bit more scarier because it's easier for a person to imagine yourself in this situation versus some like medieval or fantasy settings i would totally agree and i think if we look at horror films what percentage of those are set in the modern day i would say probably most of them yeah. your, your standard horror film it's like it's just like you are in your house often you know it's just a domestic situation that goes bad um because that because we can so easily imagine that and that's the beauty i think for call of cthulhu of the uh, the modern day setting um which i'm a you know i'm a big fan of me too right yes yes no you know on that um okay a uh, long question so given the fact that you like both old and new tabletop rpgs what is the most nostalgic theme for you in the old games made back in the 90s or 80s what do you like about the older games approach to the design and narrative uh i think i like i mean in terms of nostalgia going back to kind of old school dungeons and dragons because that's what i started with um you know, i started with a yeah, a few photocopied rules uh, and it was advanced Dungeons and Dragons um, and a bunch of, you know, teenage friends, very much like Stranger Things, I guess. Um, so going back to that sort of feel of, of just not having any big story, just going down a dungeon and fighting some monsters, you know, simple as that, that, that can be fun for me. Um, I think one of the the games that I played a lot in the 90s, I'm not sure I'd go back and play it now though, but I have a sort of nostalgia for it, is a game called Ars Magica. Are you familiar, have you had, come no. across that one? No. Um, so that was a game that was sort of, it was set in the medieval period, um, in medieval Europe. Um, and it was, it, it very much took the approach that if you, that if you were a wizard you were it, it didn't try to level out wizards and fighters and everybody else it just said wizards are the most powerful and then and then at the bottom you've got fighters and the fighters job was to defend the wizards um so everybody had a wizard character and then everybody had you had to have several characters that you could sort of change between mm -hmm. Um, so everybody have a wizard character and everybody have what was called a companion which might be like a a special fighter character or a nobleman or something like that and then you'd have a pool a shared pool of what were called grogs who were like men at arms fighters and so on um and you'd you know you'd go on missions and uh, and so on so it was kind of like Dungeons and dragons but it had a very different structure and magic was um quite improvised so um yeah it was it was a very different style it was kind of in the dungeons and dragons mold loosely you know fantasy 
uh, but a very different take on it and one that I enjoyed at the time. But I'm not sure I want to go back to the the, the rules that, that were involved. Mm -hmm. They've got a lot of work. Interesting. So coming back to Call of Cthulhu, uh, did, did you work on 7th edition or on earlier ones too? No, so uh, I worked on 7th edition. So Mike Mason and I, I think you've already spoken to Mike. Uh, uh, a friend of ours did, Sergei. Ah, okay, right, yes. Uh, so Mike Mason and I um, had ideas for a, for a new edition and we went to Chaosium and, you know, presented it to them and discussed it with them back in like 2008 and then over the next few years we next couple of years me and Mike worked on it uh, and developed it and then there was a Kickstarter and then I think it finally came out around 2014 something like that the seventh edition uh, and yeah that that was I had got a scenario, one or two scenarios out before then, so I'd, I'd published things for Call of Cthulhu prior to that. But obviously, you know, the rule book is the big, um, the the big sort of star item really in any role playing game. So getting to work on that was a, you know, uh, an honor and uh, and a lot of work. <laughs> I cannot start to imagine. Yeah, it kind of took over really, but um, but I'm, I'm very pleased. Do you need? Come on. My cat's being a nuisance. Come down here. Um, but I'm very pleased with the reception that it's had. Um, obviously, you bring a game, whatever you do, not everyone's going to love it. But I was very happy with the reception that it's had and the fact that it's been here for you know nearly 10 years. I was um, just about to say that it's an anniversary soon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so... Yeah, I don't think as much that you know, Mike and I would really sort of change about it right now. So, um, yeah, no, we're very pleased with it. Um, how did you find or choose which things to improve or adjust uh, in the system when you were offering um, the new version, the new edit? Through personal experience, I don't know, uh, yeah. play testing? Through personal experience. Um, Mike ran a, a a group called the Cult of Keepers, and they ran lots of games, Call of Cthulhu, just Call of Cthulhu games at conventions, and we'd write our own scenarios. So, and we did that for quite a few years. So there was there was a process of, there was an aspect of writing, but there was an aspect of running games, and there was an aspect of running other people's scenarios in the group. So you, I'd write a scenario and I'd run it, and maybe one of the other people would run it. They'd write a scenario, and I'd run it as well. So we'd get to compare notes about how we run the game, and we'd run for a lot of different people. Um, and I think I've always been interested in rules, um, and that's just always something that, I don't know, I, I just figure everybody does it, but I don't think they do. So when I go and see a movie, often afterwards I sort of find myself sort of thinking, oh, that was an interesting scene. How would you... How would, how would the rules handle that? Uh, you know, how would that how would that fight scene kind of work? You know, how would that, that work with, with you know, role-playing game mechanics? Uh, or how would you simulate that chase, you know, in a, in a, in, with, with role-playing game mechanics and dice? So I've always just been fascinated by that. Uh, and I was working on, you know, my own little games. And then, you know, I was showing those to Mike and uh, we sort of put our heads together and decided that, yeah, this could, this could be translated into Call of Cthulhu. Uh, and as we just, we just went through the whole book from cover to cover and just looked at everything. And we knew that a lot of it had got to stay familiar because we couldn't just start from scratch. It got to be familiar to the players who had been playing it for, what was it, like 30 years maybe. Um, so it got to feel similar, but we wanted to work. Well, we didn't want it to work differently, but we wanted to smooth some things out and present some what we felt were improved ways of doing things. Uh, and that was, you know, 
Well, yeah. I, for one, am not familiar at all with previous editions. I've only played seventh, but right. I've read and I've ran a lot of scenarios which were written for previous editions, and I ah. find it super helpful that there are very clear and very short and easy rules how to um, add transition the mm. scenarios written for the previous edition to the seventh E. So I'm yeah. not limited at all if I want to, to run something from previous um, scenarios, and this is amazing. I, I find it very helpful. Yeah, and whilst it has changed, it is easily, as you say, it's easy to uh, convert older scenarios to run in modern day. It's yeah, it's really not not very difficult. It, not not exactly in modern day, but I, I mean the scenarios which were written for for fifth or sixth the, edition. I yeah, can, you're right. I can run them with seventh. Was no I misspoke. problem. When I said modern day, I meant the modern okay. edition. Okay. Yeah, I was more yeah. like no, no, no. I, yeah, that was me. And uh, yeah, I had a quick sneak uh, look in the chat, and I must say mm -hmm. the chat is loving your cat. Oh right, <laughs> <laughs> I think she's got, I think she's got bored and gone away now. But well, yeah. maybe she'll she'll reappear. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> step away and she can take over. <laughs> um, okay, a question which I love asking people um, uh, who. How do I put it? Uh, who write for Call of Cthulhu role playing game? Mm -hmm. Does one need to read Lovecraft to be able to run or play Call of Cthulhu? No. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but can you please elaborate? Okay. So, Lovecraft uh, is a problematic figure. Um, you know, maybe that's understating it. He, he held a lot of very objectionable uh, racist views, uh, which he expressed in some of his stories, but not all of them. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that is a, not something that should be understated. You know, when it, when it comes to, when it comes to talking about Lovecraft, um, there's a lot to, to hate about the man, but people are complicated and there's also a lot that I find fascinating about him and in his work, in his art, the stuff that he created for the Cthulhu Mythos is, you know, outstanding to me. Um, and he had a, you know, th that vision that, that we drew on for the game, that those, those elements that he created about the mythos and the monsters and the gods and the um, what we broadly call the Cthulhu mythos. He started that and then other people joined in with that. Uh, and there were lots of other, you know, contemporary authors that, that he um, encouraged. And then there's been over the past, what is it, 80 years since his death or so, 90 years since his death, lots of other authors have picked up on, on elements of the Cthulhu mythos. So, um, it's a, I don't know, it's, it's almost like his creations of, of just kind of almost like they've come of age now, because I think um, people are, it, it seems more relevant than ever almost, his his idea that, that mankind or humanity, sorry, is is a is an insignificant speck in the universe, really. And that, uh, you know, we're not we're not all important and we're not the center of everything. And, you know, one day, you know, we'll all disappear and, and the universe will just carry on regardless. You know, that's kind of, I think that was his his ethos that comes across, you know, in the stories. And it's at once perhaps hopeless, but I think it's also quite realistic. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of, and one of the things I like about it is there's a whole range of gods and monsters and, and call it what you will, setting if you like, but there's no canon, there's no, definite setting so when you start you can pick and choose and mix any of that stuff in and there's no right or wrong you can't i think it's hard to say oh i don't like the setting because the setting can be anything it can be a very realistic 1920s new york it could be modern day london it can be a, a weird take on wherever you are right now with monsters running around or no monsters running around. It can be, you know, it can be pretty much anything. To me, it's like, imagine a horror film, any horror film, that's called Cthulhu to me. You know, you can 
it doesn't have to have Cthulhu and Mythos gods and uh, Mythos monsters. You can have totally new monsters. Um, and you can do that with Call of Cthulhu. And that's always been the appeal. So when I was writing scenarios, when I am writing scenarios, I don't necessarily think of them as being part of the Cthulhu mythos. I just think, what would make a creepy scenario? What would make a, a good horror game? What? And it's not even necessarily horror. It's, it's, it's often, I think, something people miss out on is it's a sense of wonder. Like, like, wow, what is going on? A sort of sense of wonder and strangeness that's not necessarily horror but mm. um and that's something that you know we in lovecraft stories they're not really often they're not horror they're more about strangeness they call them weird weird fiction um so they're more about sort of strangeness and yeah weirdness really yeah uh but so to loop back to your question, do you need to read Lovecraft? Do you need to know about that stuff? No, you can, if you got the rule book and you read through it, just the start box set, you read through that, you don't need to know all that other stuff. You totally don't need to. You read the scenario because each scenario, it's not like they all link together or that they all rely on some common background. Each one stands, well, some, some may do, but each one can stand on its own. So if you pick one up off the Miskatonic repository or in the back of one of the Chaosium books, um, often they're, they're just, you know, standalone stories. Or if you've got a campaign, like a big campaign, like we've got Master and Nalathotep, then, you know, that'll keep you going for a whole year of games. Uh, and that, you know, those, those stories all sort of slot together and build together, but they don't really rely on things outside of that campaign, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that answer your question? I don't know. Yes, yes, pretty okay. much. It's just uh, uh, it's been an ongoing discussion in many of the communities. Um, I just saw it like people are fighting over like you must read uh, Lovecraft if you are running Call of Cthulhu. After all, he is the one who invented Cthulhu. And others say no, not necessarily. I mean, it wouldn't hurt, but if you didn't, uh, it also doesn't hurt your gaming. So it's always interesting to hear the take of people um, who actually develop the system, the setting. So thank you so much. I mean, and... I will I will just say we do include one of the stories in the rule book. So that's kind of how we felt about it, because it does, you know, to get that, if you want that atmosphere, it's good to read. And some of the stories are quite short, so you can read a short one to get the atmosphere. Yep, true. Um, another question from Chad. What fiction writers do you advise to read for keepers and players for inspiration? Ligotti, Kin, Vandermeer? I think the best advice I can give is, is read the ones you enjoy. Because um, just, just find the ones you enjoy and read them. So, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Stephen King. I haven't read, like, he's written so many books. I haven't read, like, loads of them, but I read... Um, Ah, I think Desperation recently sort of set out in the desert in America and well what was the modern day I think it's set in the night written in the 90s um, and so yeah I, I, that that sort of inspires my imagination I think as I said it's I would look to um, horror writers um, I mean you yeah, know and Stephen King is probably like the one of the most popular um, but I mean there are lots of others as we said um uh, Clark Ashton Smith, um, some of his stuff is is, is, uh, is great. And some of these writers, I find I just bounce off of. You know, there's some in the in the what might be called the mythos mythos authors. Uh, you know, there's a big list of those. And some of the stuff I, I read, and I think, oh, that doesn't really do it for me. Um, but yes, you mentioned a few there. I mean, Thomas Ligotti is. There's a few that sort of stand out as being different to the others, and I'd say he is one of the ones that stands out as being different. Um, some of them feel very much like Lovecraft pastiches, uh, just kind of emulating Lovecraft without really adding very much. Um, so let me just think. Um, yeah, those, those Ligotti and um, Stephen King. Stephen King, you can pick him up anywhere. And uh, so I'd say, um, it, desperation, uh, and uh, maybe even like Salem's Lot, even though it's a vampire 
story. I, yeah, I love that. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sure I'm um, going to think of more in a minute, but. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, let me just have a quick. I will also say, actually, I don't read that much horror. Oh, excuse me. I don't read that much horror. Um, and I don't watch that many horror films. I do like horror films. Um, but when I look at the inspiration for my own scenarios, they haven't actually come from horror films. They've come from other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, what about detectives? Uh, Call of Cthulhu has a big component of a detective story of finding clues, piece piecing them together, talking to witnesses or whatever. So... Um, would you pick some of your favorite detective stories, movies, or books? Something that uh, really uh, Well, I would... If I was going to go down that route, I'd probably say True Detective. Ah, yes. Um, which, I mean, it, it had a lot of buzz at the time because there were some um, things about, you know, uh, The King in Yellow and Carcosa and so on. Uh, but, it, you know, so that... that it. it tied in a little bit but regardless of that it was just it was just great um i i, I just love that and i i would say that again call of cthulhu can be an investigative game it doesn't have to be and i've played lots of other games you know like i played curse of strad the uh, the um fifth edition D, D game and that was quite investigative to be honest, we were going around click, collecting clues, talking to people, and I kind of thought, well, really, this isn't that different to... Well, it is very different to Call of Cthulhu, but in what we're doing, in the way we're investigating things that have happened and picking up clues, it's not that different, but you, this isn't called an investigative game, but Call of Cthulhu is called an investigative game. Uh, and again, in, the, in quite a lot of the scenarios that I've created, they're not... They don't sort of follow that traditional sort of um, detective uh, trail of breadcrumbs um, line, but but that is a great model also for you know they are called investigators in the game. Um, they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, absolutely. So so and that gives a great structure for for a game. Yeah, you know, to to you know, to take you from one scene to the next and uh, to you know to be discovering things and, and putting it all together. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, another comment from Chad. Oh, wow. Just say to Paul that he is cool. Paul, you're cool. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Chad. Um, yeah, I was uh, about to talk about some of the scenarios you uh, worked on. And uh, I guess everyone has a clue where you draw inspiration for Dockside Dogs. Yes. Uh, <laughs> However, uh, My Little Sister and uh, Full Fathom 5, they have very different vibes from both Dockside Dogs and one another. I mean, uh, The Little Sister is uh, set in near future. Yeah. Uh, Sci-fi vibes and yes. um, Full Fathom 5, it's like uh, 19th century whaler, um, whalers. Yes. Very different. Uh, if you can tell, tell a few words what inspired you? Why why you chose such interesting settings? Well, I think much like with with Dockside Dogs, you know, um, I didn't. I, I it was obviously it's based on or it's inspired by Reservoir Dogs, the Quentin Tarantino film, which is now like thirty years old. Um, but I didn't start by sort of thinking, oh, I'm going to make a scenario about Reservoir Dogs. It was I started on a scenario totally unrelated uh and then i just kind of worked on it and worked on it and struggled with it and then i think i had the idea that they were gangsters and then i thought oh it could be like res it could be like reservoir dogs um so that that was how that one sort of came about the the whaling one is inspired by moby dick um so a friend a long time ago recommended uh herman melville's novel moby dick and i read it and i loved it uh, I mean, it's it's a big fat book and it's a lot of reading, but and it's I love it because I haven't really read that many things that are that old either because it's like 1850, which to me is you know most of the things that I've read are much more much more recent. Um, and yeah, just that that feel, 
and I just thought this is, you know, it's, it's out in the ocean and Call of Cthulhu has a, the, the story Call of Cthulhu has a, as a chapter when they're out on the ocean and really a rises and, and all of that. And I thought, well, that's, that's just ripe for a, a kind of crossover. Uh, and the other thing about having a whaling ship, of course, is your one of the things that struck me about the book is you, they were out for years, not like a few weeks to catch a whale and then come back. They'd be out for years. And so you've got 23 crew on a ship. And the horror often, horror scenarios often rely on isolation. If you can somehow like trap the people in a, in a house and the, the, you know, they can't leave because of the snow or whatever, well, that's ideal because the monsters can come and there's nowhere they can go. So having a ship out on the ocean, you, you're stuck, you know? So that, that just seemed like a great location for a, a horror story. My little sister is is set aboard. Well, is set uh, in the in the uh, in the future aboard a spaceship. Um, quite a f yeah. This this one's kind of got a twist in the tale, so I can't give. I don't want to give spoilers. This, for this is an one, amazing but, um, twist. I've read this scenario right, like three you know times, it. and I okay. love it absolutely. <laughs> And so that's one that came out of from years ago from the, the Court of Keepers scenarios, that one is. Um, and uh, But it's also, as you said, isolated, a group of people who do not have very many options on where to go to or who yeah. ask for help. They have to rely yeah. on one another. And, and it was very much written as a convention scenario. Um, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Played that, run that lots of times at conventions. Um, and. When we stop recording, I'll tell you what film it was based on. Okay. It's not based on a film, but it's inspired by a film. And when I watched the film again a, a couple of years ago, I was like, oh, God, I've forgotten that I was so inspired by this film. It's, it's... I had some ideas. Oh, OK, well. <laughs> and if you're yeah. watching it on YouTube, leave us a comment on which movie do you think this scenario was yes. inspired by. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah stepping a bit ba uh, back uh, for Full Fathom 5, I actually I'm a big fan of modern day scenarios. So I think I read a lot of those and, and run a lot of those. But somehow, um, Full Fathom 5, I don't know, slipped my attention, probably mm. because of the setting and topic. And just about a month ago, a friend of mine, we were talking about different scenarios and he's like, yeah, but Full Fathom 5, I was like, I, I never heard of it. And he's like, yeah, by Paul Fricker. I was like, I know Paul, Paul Fricker scenarios. <laughs> I love them. I never heard of this one. So I just played it about a month ago. Um, and for me, and actually for the whole group, the feeling was it was not as scary to play like the mm, supernatural part but the whole process of describing the setting a ship in 19th century and uh, all of the process i imagine is described in the scenario too because i didn't read it yeah. <laughs> on the plate and uh, the keeper was saying like so you're going for about a year and then you have to and he describes in, de in detail how you have to pin through whale skin then you have to uh, swim after it in a little boat for a couple hours yeah. while it wears off and all of the details uh, given in the scenario that's what was sort of creepy for the whole group because did people actually do it? I know. And it's it's, it's relatively not so long ago. Yeah. yeah, it's really not that long ago. Um, yeah, it's it's mind-boggling, you know, what what was involved. Yeah, that, that's, and that's what I meant that when I read it I sort of thought I had this vision that whaling ships went out for, a, you know, a few days or a week or two to catch a whale. I, I had no conception they were out for years. Um, and uh, yeah, it just sounds grueling, you know, but, you know, many people's lives, well, uh, you know, I can believe be very difficult. For me, Call of Cthulhu is the game which is very... Um, enlightening because every time when i'm preparing uh, for a game mm. as a keeper i'm doing research and i'm discovering so much things for myself uh, be it a, a period of time or some specific country or i don't know discovery there is always something to google and to, to learn um, yes so i imagine you're also doing a lot of preparation when developing scenarios yeah you're right i mean sometimes i'll leave a bit until the end i think oh i'll leave 
I don't know, like the floor plan of the house. I'll, 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 I'll just sketch it out by hand and then I'll try and find an authentic one later. And then you go start doing research about houses in that place, what it, you know, wherever it might be, you know, for example. And then you start finding out things of, of that period and about the, the architectural, you know, whatever it is. And, and it starts to uh, give you more ideas about your scenario is what I find. So when you start doing research, um, often it can just be, I don't know, just strange things or interesting things or things that you didn't know about that, that will not only inform the scenario and give it background, but they can also trigger ideas in your head. Uh, you sort of think, oh, well, that, I didn't know that they did that thing, but that, that ties in with my ideas in some way or I could adapt that. So I think that's what you're looking for is, is partly background information just to give a sense of place and time to make it feel realistic. And that can be modern day or whatever. But also partly inspiration uh, as, a, you know, when you're writing to, to anything that sort of sparks your imagination, you know, grab that with both hands and, and run with it. Cool. And uh, naturally I transfer to one of the campaigns, which I know you also wrote and edited for, The Two-Headed Serpent. Oh, right, I'm yes. currently running this campaign for my cast. Uh, they've oh. just got back from North Borneo. And I just love how the campaign takes you to so many different, quite exotic locations. I bet you enjoyed working on that. Um, yes. Do you mind telling us a bit about how how did the work go? How did campaign change through time and additions? So myself and Matt Sanderson and Scott Dorwood uh, were the team that, that developed and wrote uh, Two-Headed Serpent. And it was the first Pulp Cthulhu campaign. And Pulp Cthulhu uh, allows for much more kind of powerful, effective investigators that, that you know, they're not just like regular people. Uh, and that meant that we could bring in more powerful monsters without, you know, killing all the characters, perhaps. Um, and also one of my visions for Pulp is Indiana Jones you know, and, and his adventures and how they would, you know, you'd, you'd see the map and it'd be dot, dot, dot around the world to some other location. So it had to sort of go around the world in different places, I think, because part of Pulp is that that sense of adventure, that sense of exploration and adventure around the world. Um, I think the, one of the interesting ways it developed was we were very conscious that we had some different factions in the game and some key NPCs. And we wanted to keep it open such that the players, you know, might be working with one faction, but then down the line, they might switch and work with a different faction or one of the NPCs might come to them and, and try and persuade them one way or the other, or one of the NPCs might get killed. So there are a few like major NPCs in there and we'd, you know, somebody would be writing, like, say, the fifth chapter or something, and they'd be saying, oh, you know, when this NPC does this thing, we'd be like, well, hold on. What if they died in chapter two? <laughs> so we'd have to sort of, you know, think of, of ways. And we wanted to keep it open so that there was that possibility. So we wanted to make it, give it a structure, but make it quite flexible, I think. So, you know, any of those characters can get killed and it's accommodated for, you know, in the later scenario, we'll say, well, if that if that important NPC died earlier, substitute this person uh, or change it in this way. Because um, it's always a challenge writing a campaign because a one shot, you got to start, middle and end, done. With a campaign, you've got that in a chapter and then you've got it in the next chapter. And what they did in the previous chapter might, you know, hopefully has some influence in the next chapter. So. You know, there's a there's a there's a challenge to doing that and, and, and keeping the investigators on or heroes in, in Pulp Cthulhu you know, on track as well. Um, but that that campaign was um, yeah, a huge amount of fun to, to write and play test. And yeah, you know, it's another thing I'm really pleased with how how much it's how much I hear about it getting played. You know, I'm very pleased, Tasha, that you're you're running it and having fun with it, I hope. Um, oh, we do. We do. Great. 
Kat. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Oh, okay, it's a question for me. <laughs> when uh, we will have the next episode of The Serpent, uh, guys, we will definitely have it. I'm sorry to say that I'm. Um, I have some health condition now, which is why we had to stop uh, running games, which I run, but uh, we will continue, definitely. I have all of the things prepared, and once I'm better, we will definitely continue. Hopefully, soon enough. But it's happening. Yeah, uh, meanwhile... Uh, Paul, if Call of Cthulhu, Delta Green, Rivers of London did not exist, what RPG would be of interest to you? It's also a question from chat. If none of those existed. Ooh, um, <laughs> I'd have to write my own, wouldn't I? No, if, if none of them... I thought you would say it. <laughs> you th what, you thought I'd say that? You thought you'd say that you'd need to write something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, there, there are so many... Ro this is one of the things. There's so many role-playing games out now. And there'll be probably next week there'll be more role-playing games published than you're ever going to play in your life. So yeah, every week, like nowadays, there's so many games published. Um, but I would give a shout. Okay, let's put all those to one side. None of those exist. Uh, there's a game called Liminal um, by uh, a friend of mine called Paul Michener. Um, that's, uh, Liminal Horror? Well, uh, no, I think there's two different games. This okay. is just Liminal. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this is, uh, it's a, independently published um game and uh, it's a kind of modern day um uh, what do you call it kind of urban horror well sort of uh, game um and that's getting a lot of love um in the kind of local community here so you know if i had to pick one then yeah i'll pick that how about that cool thank you um, so let's um, also have a bit uh, of brainstorm. Uh, if I would, uh, uh, if I would have to ask you about uh, some modern era non-typical object or location, what could it be? Uh, haunted house is an immortal classic, but what would you pick today? Haunted banking machine, cursed weapon device. For for a device, for an item. Ooh. I don't know object I, I... Or, or location or whatever. I think location. I think what I talked about the, um, you know, the isolated places. Uh -huh. I like the idea of doing one in the city, you know, in a big, in a big busy city of, of trying to do a, a horror scenario. I've never done, I, have I done that? Maybe I have, I can't think. But, you know, one that's in the heart of a city, because even in a city with loads of people around you, you can still be very isolated you know, be, for various reasons. Um, so I like the idea of, well, well, I have participated in, in writing Rivers of London, but you know, maybe like a Call of Cthulhu scenario set like bang in the middle of London um, in the modern day is, is something I'd really like to do. Um, and just to, it's that idea of having isolation for whatever reason that might be, but with millions of people around. That, that's something that intrigues me. Um, as far as items go, I don't know. I, I tend to pick whatever fits. Um, you know, the, these things are just kind of uh, whatever fits the the moment for me. Yeah, so I don't really know what they are until I start writing. Uh, very true. We had a, um, a friend of mine just told me um, we were. Uh, I was helping her to play test a scenario for Call of Cthulhu. At the first one she wrote for the system and she did it on a challenge so three people gave her three random words oh. and out of that she made a scenario so right. uh, it was a very unusual way to write um, a detective slash horror scenario it is yes yes but it also it's... challenges you in many ways how to oh, put all of the things together yeah. i think she, she, she had a coffee machine an umbrella and um, cinnamon for words. Oh, that sounds difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go with fountain pen. That's what I think I'd pick a haunted, a haunt, well, not haunted necessarily, but a, a fountain pen <laughs> could, could uh, is an interesting item because, you know, who might have used it before um, and, you know, what might it write when you're, you, you know, you're not thinking and you've just got it in your hand and it starts writing words all on its own. That kind of, that intrigues me. 
fun. <laughs> yeah. Minute, looking through my notes. Oh. Um, so what are you working on now? Can we get some sneak peeks or announcements or what can we expect? Um, okay, yes. In I'm... the near future. What am I working on now? So there's a few things uh, that we're working on with Chaosium. Uh, one of them is has been talked about, so I can I can mention that. So that's a um, there's a collection of scenarios called Mansions of Madness mm -hmm. that's already published, but we've that was titled Mansions of Madness Volume One. So we've now got Volume Two. So that's coming out. Ooh, nice. Um, so, so I edited the scenarios in that and went through and and uh, uh, that was that was something I I developed. Uh, I've got a couple of other things that I'm working on with them that I don't think I can talk about right now. I mean, it's not like they're ultra confidential. We don't tend to put the things out simply because these things can take a long time. And if you say now, people in a month's time, people are like, well, where's that thing you talked about? <laughs> they're like, well, I know exactly the feeling. <laughs> um, but what I can say, and I, I feel bad because I've been talking about this for a year. Well, over a year now, I've been saying, oh, I'm going to get this thing done you see this is why i shouldn't mention it because i mentioned this in <laughs> interviews about a year ago i think um so i've got a, a scenario called gatsby and the great race that that was the first one i published getting on for 20 years ago um and i'm just today i've been actually working on that to get that uh, a new edition of that put out because that's not available mm. at all at the moment um and that's a an unusual game in that um it can be played as a traditional one keeper you know and up to six players or it can be played with up to 24 players in different groups and about six or seven gms i've heard about it i actually tried to to find it but i failed because the concept is absolutely fascinating and i was like how can one pull something like that? I would love to to have a look behind the scenes, but I, I couldn't find the, um, the book. Well, uh, if, if well, I've got your email. When when it when I've finished it and it, and it comes out, I'll send you a copy. Thank you so much, and we we all um, hope that the new edition will also uh, come to life sometime soon, so that ever, everybody can enjoy it. It will. It will. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we also have. Um, uh, comment from Chad that uh, people hope uh, that they will be able to see this um, scenarios in Ukrainian. We surely hope so too, and we have uh, we now have an excellent uh, localization. Uh, Gikach is working on it, working hard, and I know that they already have plans for future books localizations too. So let's support yeah, them let's let's buy some uh, starter sets boxes now when they're still on pre-order and show them our support um with um, buying the books that's actually the best support you can give to the uh, and editors and, and publishers so yeah 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 definitely uh, well my next question was about the plans but you sort of answered that um already and uh, yeah, our last call for the questions from the chat. If there is mm -hmm. anything else, guys, you would want uh, me to ask Paul, this is uh, your opportunity. And uh, yeah, what? also, if sorry, if you're watching this uh, on YouTube uh, in the future, it's future for us, but this would be present time for you. Uh, let us know in comments if you want to see some run throughs of. Uh, uh, other poll scenarios on our channel, Dogside Dogs, or Little Sister, My Little Sister Wants You to Suffer, or Full Fathom 5, which we've been talking about uh, today, uh, we will definitely take it into consideration, uh, because I I love the scenarios. Uh, it'd be fun to see if you guys are interested, so let me quickly check. So let me ask, can I, whilst you're looking for the next question, Tasha, yep. can I ask you a couple of questions? Of course, by all means. So, so what's out in Ukrainian already? Is it just the quick start, you said? Uh, yes, we have a quick start with a haunting yep. scenario. It's oh, already yeah, out. 
uh, the great. PDF is free and uh, uh, you can uh, buy print on demand, uh, printed on demand version. Right. Um, it's really affordable. And uh, the starter box uh, set uh, is now in work. I think PDF is either already available or for those who pre-ordered or will be available soon. And uh, yeah. yes, we are waiting for printed copies. Very right. excited. And uh, yeah, I know that there are some plans to, to, uh, to localize some more books, but I'm not allowed to talk about it oh, anymore. Okay, no, I know how that is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but, both of those are great because they give, also they're, they're really good for, for new players who aren't familiar with the game because they give the rules in a, you know, a condensed form of the rules as well. And, but you could use the quick start or the, you know, the rules that are in the starter box set. Yeah, you can use that just to go on and play lots of other scenarios. Yes, um, yes, exactly. I'm personally, I, I hate reading rules. I'm just, uh, uh, I'm terrible. I lose attention all the time. And for me, it's a nightmare. And what I loved uh, about Call of Cthulhu when I started GMing it, it was just a few pages and you're done yeah. and you can start playing and you can play the scenarios from the box and you can play any other scenarios or you can invent something uh, yourself and this is really enough and then when, when you have more questions it's super cool to go to the keeper's guide and to yeah. to discover all of the little details but i personally believe this is the best starter set i i saw yet i, I must say i didn't see like a whole lot of starter sets but sure. i've seen a few yeah yeah uh, and i just love how it is balanced and how information is selected the only thing if if i'm allowed to give mm. a bit of the feedback yeah. i don't think the starter set gives uh, any information about push draws which is kind of a big thing does it not hmm. i'll i'll okay, double check I'll, I'll but take I, I, I i'll think take a note so. of that and, uh, and and take a look it will be very embarrassing if I'm wrong. <laughs> oh, well, no, I'm sure you're right. Yeah, uh, well, we have a last question, I believe. Okay. Uh, question about the detective part of the scenarios. How to mm -hmm. balance riddles and puzzles in scenarios or campaigns so that it is not too difficult, but also not too easy? How do the authors themselves do it? Okay, I mean, when it comes to puzzles, you know, let's call it puzzles, you know, riddles, anything where you've got to figure out a solution, put pieces together and figure out what's going on or an answer to a riddle or a, you know, whatever it is, something that needs to be figured. It can be, it can be something that the player's got to figure out or it can be something that the investigator's going to figure out. And some people, love figuring that stuff out some people hate figuring that stuff out so i think you have to offer both solutions and obviously if you're playing with people you don't know then this isn't so easy but if you're playing with a group that you know then you know in that sort of initial setup ask them you know try and figure out do what what sort of game do they like do they like figuring out puzzles and clues and codes in person and if they like doing that then then you can give them that stuff but otherwise if they say no we don't really want to be doing loads of code breaking and, and putting puzzles together ourselves then it can be done with um, dice rolls you can use intelligence rolls or education rolls or whatever to, to figure things out um, so as with many of these things there's no single answer it the best answer is work with work try and work with your group to to work in a way that, that they enjoy because uh, that's one of the things about particularly with well maybe not particularly with call of cthulhu but so, certainly something we're very aware of with call of cthulhu is different people play it in different ways uh, and you can't be too prescriptive about this is how you must do it because you know that that's something you you know, the more different people you play with and the more different groups you get exposed to, the more you realize that lots of people enjoy it in different ways and they want different things. Um, so when it comes to how, I mean, you also sort of said, how, how, how do you pitch the difficulty? Um, I think we go through the scenarios and we review them in such a way as to make 
that there's a, you know, if it's an investigation, there's a path through the, there's more than one path through the investigation. That's important. And it's important that there aren't dead ends. Um, so, because you want to, you want to give the feel of there being an investigation and the feel of some um, challenge. But you don't want to get halfway through. Oh, you got a cat too. <laughs> I've got two. You don't want to get halfway through the investigation. Then they're like, well, I don't know. I give up, you know. So there always needs to be a way through. And that can be that maybe they don't figure it very well. And rather than that stopping them, that makes life more difficult for them in terms of the challenges that they then face. So maybe there's, you know, if they if they figure things out and do really well, there's kind of a, a maybe a, a slightly easier way through things. And if they go down the, the bad routes or they don't figure things out so well, then they're, they're, you know, their lives get harder. But it's not that they're, the game comes to an abrupt end ever. It should always be a, you know, a route through. Thank you. Uh, another question from Chad. What was the most uncommon thing that inspired writing something? Oh, the most uncommon thing. Ooh. These are tricky questions. I know. Um, yeah, that's all I have to think about. Um, I'm... Sh I'm I these are the kind of questions that I'd, I'd, I'd need warning of, I think, to be able to, to trawl back in my well, mind. Well, it's not coming from me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, probably some, yeah, I don't know, mundane things, but... I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw one out. This isn't really answering the question. Um, but there was one scenario around, and uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but the, the, it was just about some cakes. Well, it was the scenario cakes. wasn't about cakes, but there was an instance when the, the, they were offered some cakes and they were made by, the, the implication was the cakes were made by this person, but the, the, the players already knew that this person had died like weeks ago. Oh. Um, so it was a really mundane thing that just um, caused a, a lot of um, intrigue, I think, because it implied that this person was still alive. Um, so sometimes really mundane little things, when you put them into the scenario, they don't have to be big mysteries. Sometimes little mundane things can can uh, trigger people's imagination. Um, equally, I can remember like one of the carrots went up in the attic and they said, oh, what, what's in the attic? And I said, oh, well, there's some boxes. And they were like, what's in the boxes? And I just said, oh, curtains. Just because that was the first thing I could think of. I hadn't even planned that they would go up in the attic. <laughs> and they got really fascinated by the fact there were curtains. Why are there curtains? Oh, well, why would you put curtains in the attic? And I'm like, I don't know. I just figured that might be something people would put up in the attic in a box. Um, so, yeah. Sorry if that didn't answer your question, Chad, um, but that's the best I could come up with off the top of my head. Thank you. Thank you. So we are finishing uh, with not the last question, but with a comment. Thank you, Paul. It was very interesting. I appreciate the insight. Tasha, the jacket looks great on you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, the last one also coming in. I also heard that you created a course for writing scenarios where it can be found if it is still available. Yes, so that's what I referred to earlier. That, so it's the storytellingcollective.com. I'm just going to quickly Google that and just make sure I'm, I've got the name right. Story. Um, I'm pretty sure I've got that. If right. you can send me the link, I'll share it with the chat. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Storytelling Collective. Uh, and so that, they're the group that I was talking about that do all the, the different courses. Uh, and the, so there's that one about writing your own adventure. And that is still available. What they used to do was they used to do a sort of a, a start, all the people together, all the sort of new people doing it, they'd start like a couple of times a year. But now I think, if I'm not mistaken, they, it's just a rolling thing. So you can you can enroll at any time. So it costs a little bit of money. It's not it's not a huge amount of money, but there's there's a there is a fee for it. And but you do get a lot for that. And I've had a lot of people I'm not the only person that's written for this course. It was an established course already. 
Um, but there's been a lot of people that have um, you know, gone through that course and uh, found it very helpful and then gone on to write and publish their own works on the Miskatonic repository, which mm-hmm. is the, the Call of Cthulhu um, sort of community content page on Drive Through RPG, uh, which is a great resource. There's tons of great stuff on there. Um, yeah. Um, okay. This will be absolutely the last question, okay. Chad. I'm sorry <laughs> we need to le- let Paul go. And uh, this is not an easy or short question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe you have some quick advice for people who are planning to write their first scenario. Yes, <laughs> I do. And I wrote it all down and I put it in that course. But I think my my, my main advice would be write a scenario that you that, that that you're excited about don't try and write a call of cthulhu scenario like other call of cthulhu scenarios because i think a lot of people start and they think it needs to be in the mold of other call of cthulhu scenarios use the format that we use where it starts with introduction uh keeper information um uh persona uh what's it what's the word uh dramatis personae and then scenes and then conclusion and then the character stats use that format look at the modern scenario format that we publish you know the recent scenarios in and use that as a template to put your scenario onto but you know just just whatever excites you about a sort of a horror scenario uh just just run with that you know it doesn't have to it doesn't have to use the published monsters it doesn't have to use a a, a standard setting it can be you know whatever you want it to be it can it's really flexible so um yeah don't feel constrained if i may add a little Mm. bit from my experience what i love about call of cthulhu setting and, and concept you can just take anything you like anything which inspires you, anything which scares you, and say, well, that's just a new avatar of uh, Nyarlathotep, yep. or this is a new creation of Shab Nigurat. And there you go. <laughs> it's in the setting, but you can invent whatever whatever you like. Uh, it, does done... not, it does not go, it does not have to go strictly under the monster manual or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can go, we've got a big book of monsters called the uh, Malleus Monstrorum. Yeah. Um, and you can, you know, some people like to go to that and just leaf through that and look at a monster and say, oh, I'm going to make a scenario about, you know, based around that. Um, other people look uh, for for interesting places in the world and make a scenario about that. Or they, or they're particularly interested in an event that you know, might, maybe there was some event that happened, you know, in 1973 and they're going to do a, a scenario based on that. Or they're interested in some public figure and they're going to, you know, fictionalize them and, and make it about that. So there's, there's so many different starting points that you can pick on. And really it's just, you pick one because you're interested in it. Because I'm, I'm excited about that thing. It's, it's got my attention. You know, like I said, I read Moby Dick. And that was, it's whatever is going around in your head. I think it's sort of just a way of, if you can work a way of sort of making that into a into a scenario, uh, if that's the way your mind works, then that's that's the way to go. I think. Great, thank you. Is um, is there anything you would like to tell uh, to say to our Ukrainian viewers? Uh, Yes, there is. I'd like to say Slava Ukraini. Hello, I'm Slava. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight and answering all of our questions. Thank you, Chad, for being here. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe and leave us a comment because this is how we know that you like what we are doing. And this is a great uh, support. Thank you one again, once again and uh, see you later. Thank you. Bye.